Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes here for Clark College Network Technology Department with another lecture from our NTech 142 Cloud Computing Fundamentals course. We're looking today at Chapter 3, Technical Perspectives. We'll be looking at the differences between public and private clouds. We've looked at that now for the past two chapters and we'll continue to further define those. We'll look at techniques and methods for cloud computing deployment, cloud computing risks and challenges, and the impact of cloud computing on application development and architecture. Let's get started with the first, differences between public and private clouds. Since we've covered this before, I don't have a whole lot for it. Private clouds are provisioned for exclusive use by a single organization, public clouds, on the other hand, offer their services to anyone with an internet connection. Private clouds often are billed by department or business unit. So a private cloud, again, owned by the company. So I, I've worked for several companies uh, that have private clouds and they would bill, say, the marketing department or R&D research and development for the amount of cloud resources they use. So oftentimes these are called chargebacks and they're used to be able to pay the costs of, of uh, upkeep and maintenance on the infrastructure. So in the end, the organization as a whole is much more efficient than trying to have each department buy and maintain their own servers and their own IT. And I've actually worked for a big university where each college within the university had their own IT department and their own servers and equipment. And that is very costly and decentralized versus a centralized IT department like we have here at Clark College, which provides its services for, for the whole of the organization. All right, let's take a look at SaaS. So SaaS is, remember, software as a service, and this can be run on a private or public cloud. And with SaaS, you typically, like most applications, have to provide it some data. So you're uploading data into the cloud and downloading data out of the cloud. So you might migrate your local data to the cloud called an upload so that your cloud-based SaaS app can use it. You know, a SaaS app, a Google Docs is an example of a, of a SaaS application. So if you've ever used the cloud-based Google Docs to um, create a spreadsheet or a Word type document, that's a SaaS application and migrating something you have locally, maybe you have a Word doc or an Excel sheet that is on your system locally and you want to be able to edit and work with that up in the cloud using Google Docs, you'd have to migrate that, upload it into your cloud environment so it's accessible to your SaaS app. That's what we're talking about. They're web services, so they're available um, through web browsers and different cloud-based apps use common protocols to communicate. That way they can share data and settings. And one standard that they use for this is XML. XML is a language, a coding language for the internet. It's a web-based coding language. And many web services like Google Docs support XML. That allows you to um, communicate effectively between different documents. All right, we also have what's called a content distribution network. And I've mentioned this a little bit before, but I didn't put the name on it, content distribution network. One advantage of cloud is, especially in a public cloud, where there may be data centers strewn across the country, even around the world, is being able to put the data closest to the users that are accessing it. So here on the west coast of the United States, we might, with a content distribution network, be able to put data that is more, uh, uh, more accessed on the West Coast here on the West Coast. So it would go into Portland or a um, Washington data center, and it would be quicker for those West Coast customers to access it. Uh, there's even models where it migrates across the country. So early in the morning, it is on the East Coast where they start work three hours before us. And so that data is housed there. And then throughout the day, it migrates to West Coast data centers. So it is more quickly available here. 
And so that's the idea of a content distribution network is moving the cloud content around so that it is closest in proximity. Is there a big difference? No. I mean, if you're going from here to New York on the internet, it doesn't take much longer than here to Seattle, but it's relative, right? It does take longer. It's just a couple nanoseconds, maybe a second. I mean, it's a very small slice of time, but it does make a difference. And when you're talking about a lot of transactions, a lot of access points, those seconds or fractions of seconds add up. And if we're looking more globally, it definitely makes a difference if you're accessing a server in Asia or in the Euro um, zone versus accessing a server that's right, uh, right in your region. Moving on, the next topic, techniques and methods for cloud computing deployment. A big one is the network. All clouds need a network, computer network. That could be the internet, or it could be a private network if you have a private cloud. And even if you have a public cloud, you need to get there somehow. So yeah, part of that's the internet, but you also probably have a private network that connects you to that internet. So networks have locations, right? You have different locations, um, physical sites on your network. You also measure performance based on bandwidth and latency. Let's talk briefly about those two. Bandwidth is the capacity. That's how much information fits on the wires. Latency is how fast that information moves across the wires. So it's two measurements of speed. The latency is measured in, um, in the actual speed in seconds, milliseconds nanoseconds. It's the time it takes for information to traverse the wire from point A to point B, and that's your latency. Bandwidth is always measured in a quantity, like uh, megabits per second, gigabits per second. It's how much information can move across the wire in one second. So two different ways to measure your, um, your speed. If you're moving huge amounts of information, you care more about bandwidth. If you're moving small amounts of information, you care more about latency. Some examples, if you are buying stocks on the stock market, you're what they call a day trader, you would care about the latency. A stock purchase isn't moving very much data, but when you click buy or sell, you want that, that action to move to the servers on the stock market rapidly so that you can get the buy or sell price exactly where you want it. Same if you're a gamer, you're playing games, you care more about the latency. The bandwidth isn't so important. Games usually have all the, all the bandwidth heavy components installed locally on your local computer. And so the game server is just taking your, um, you know, when you hit the fire button and stuff like that, the small little commands, those need to move very rapidly so that you can be competitive in the game. So latency would uh, would be what you're concerned with. Let's look at some uh, bandwidth uh, favored scenarios. Netflix, if you're streaming a movie, you care about bandwidth. A movie is a lot of video and sound, like action, a lot of big files moving. So you want the bandwidth that can really carry that heavy file load. Then we have access control. That's sometimes we call it a firewall. Access control or firewall is preventing certain types of traffic and allowing others. And uh, you can think of this kind of like a bouncer at a bar that's making sure underage um, folks don't get in, checking IDs or um, any, any kind of uh, access control that, that you want to come up with an analogy for, but making sure that the right things get in and the wrong things don't. So that's access control. You definitely want to have that on a network is a little bit of security. We call that today cyber security. So that's your access control. And you want to have redundancy. And redundancy, we brought up the, um, the term before. It's the idea that parts of your network could fail, components could fail, and the network would continue to operate. So usually that would be like having two internet connections on your network. So if you had a company network, you would not just rely on a single point of entry to the internet. You would purchase two, and usually from two different companies. So if you had purchased one from, say, Comcast, you would purchase another one from Verizon. You wouldn't want them both from the same provider because it could be that the outage is on, say, Comcast network. And so if you have both your connections from the same provider, they'd both be down. So you'd have two edge routers providing your firewalls, so two different firewalls. You'd also want duplication in your core switches. So if a switch 
were to fail or a port, a key port were to fail. The idea is to eliminate single points of failure. You can't get rid of them all. Usually your endpoints, the PCs you're using, those will continue to be your single points of failure. Or if a wireless access point goes out, you'll have to move physically to another wireless access point in, in the building or the campus. So it is not that we're removing all the points of failure, but redundancy, you can think of a good analogy as having a spare tire in your car. The likelihood that one of your four tires will eventually fail is pretty good. Why don't they have two or three spare tires? You know, that would be better redundancy, and that's that balance. Um, redundancy is expensive and burdensome, so you want to add enough redundancy that you can survive simple outages, but you don't necessarily want to go, you know, all militaristic on your redundancy and carry around, you know, a trailer full of spare tires with you. So um, you want to get the right balance, but having no redundancy is risky. And especially if you depend on the cloud and cloud computing, it would be very risky because your business model could suffer. Your employees could be without the um, apps and the data that they need to do their job. And, and that would add up pretty quick having those unproductive employees that you still have to pay. Right. Automation and self-service. This is what really makes the cloud a good return on investment is the ability to automate. We can take tasks that used to take weeks or months, and we can do them in minutes. If they're automated, usually we have um, some pre-written scripts that you provide a few, um, a few variables, a few settings, and it can build a new server for you in a few seconds. So you can, you can have a bunch of automation and the tools to automate are what cloud providers um, sell you or, or um, provide with your service. And then the idea of self-service. Again, with, with the traditional IT, you would have to make a request and the request would get approved and then someone in IT at some point would do the work and, and the new server or the new service or the new app would get added to the uh, network and be available for use. And, and that process, again, could take weeks or months. With self-service, you just go into a web portal and turn up what you need. So self-service allows um, for, for a great many cloud services you to be able to turn them on and off yourself and expand them and create extras. And remember, you, you may get billed if it's a private cloud, you'll get a charge back for that extra usage, but you're able to be um, in the driver's seat for your department. You're able to go in and turn up those services on demand now. And so that is saving money because you don't have all those people involved and all that waiting and downtime waiting for services that you need right now, waiting weeks or months for them. We got that down to minutes or hours. So those are key to reducing operational expenses. Let's talk about the concept of federation. Federation is where you have several different cloud services and it doesn't make sense to have individual logins to all those cloud services. So Federation provides one trusted source of usernames and passwords that you can use with those services. So a third party authenticator. And some examples, if you've ever logged into a website, maybe it's a, a shopping site that, that sells things, a retail site, and they allow you to use your Google or Facebook account. That's federation. So federated services, I have several small uh, sites, maybe social networks or, um, or shopping sites, that instead of having to build an individual account with that site, I can just use my Google or Facebook account and they will trust that as, a, uh, as an account from that trust provider. So Google and Facebook are identity or trust providers. And there, there are many of those out there. Microsoft's another one, of course, we could go on and on. But these providers are allowing these third-party companies to share their, their customer's username password um, through a certificate. They never actually share the username password. They share a unique certificate that identifies that your, your, um, your account is valid. Okay, let's take a look at standardization. Obviously, if we're going to build clouds and we're going to have uh, our data up there and our apps, we need some type of standardization. And we talked about this last chapter in terms of avoiding vendor lock-in. 
Vendor lock-in is when you have proprietary protocols and not standard. And companies steer free of most proprietary clouds because they want to be able to move their things. What if you put things in the Amazon cloud and next year you want to move it to the Microsoft cloud? If you are using standardized services and Amazon and Microsoft do for the most part, you'll be able to easily move your data and your services from cloud provider to cloud provider. So that would be using uh, data formats that are recognized standards and not proprietary formats, using data storage, which is standardized using standard VM images. You could have proprietary images that only work with a certain hypervisor, or you can use a standard image. Um, one example of a standard image is called an OVA file. OVAs are a, um, an exportable file that can be uploaded into various clouds. And there's a lot of work on standardization. One big one is called OpenStack. OpenStack is an attempt to provide all these standards in a stack, a stack of standards that all, all cloud providers will eventually adopt. And there's big movement behind the OpenStack. An API is a programming interface that will allow your third party companies to write their software to work with your software. This is really important for most companies to have um, APIs in their cloud provider because there's certain services your cloud provider may not be providing you and they just may not be available. But if there's APIs, you can in-house write your own code, your own programs to tie into that cloud provider. That's what an API is, is a tie-in or a bridge into their software that allows you to add functionality. And then identity information, we talked about that on the last slide. How are you identifying people, usernames, passwords, accounts? You know, is that in a format that can be moved from one cloud provider to another? Application performance. Well, applications need to perform, right? And in the cloud, that can be complicated. When you have an application running on your personal computer, right on your desk, that, that's easier to uh, get the performance. If uh, application's running slow, you may need to put a, a better CPU or more RAM or shut down some of your other applications. In the cloud, we look at some similar things. First, it's bandwidth and latency. If your application is performing poorly, if it's slow, you probably don't have enough bandwidth or you have too high latency. You can actually have high bandwidth and high latency, which is a problem. You want low latency, fast, but high bandwidth. So let's look at a technology that is high bandwidth, high latency, satellite. So if you're doing satellite internet, you have tremendous bandwidth, huge bandwidth, but it takes up to two seconds for those bits to move from point A to point B. So that's really high latency. That means when you click in an app, it will be two seconds later before that click is recognized on the server. So that makes it almost unusable for, for those type of use cases is sat satellite internet because of the high latency. I give you a, a example of high bandwidth, high latency. Let's look at low bandwidth, low latency, just about as unusable, and that's a dial-up modem. You've probably heard of these. Uh, they, they're way back with the beginning of the internet. You could connect your phone line to a little box that would talk over the human phone line and make squawking sounds. They call the modem. And uh, a phone line is very low latency, so it's fast. So the sounds move very quick. In fact, the latency is usually under 20 milliseconds, so it's extremely low latency. But the bandwidth is also extremely low, things like 56 kilobits per second, an unusably small amount of data for today's world. So those are two extremes, satellite internet and um, telephone lines, uh, giving you examples of high bandwidth, high latency, and low bandwidth, low latency. So what you really want is the perfect is high bandwidth, low latency, right? You want a lot of bandwidth and very low latency. And there's a lot of providers that, that offer that, uh, you know, people that can provide you fiber optic connections. Even your cable connection is, is pretty good in, in those regards. All right, CPU. And that would be the CPU on your, on your end and also on the servers that are in the cloud running these applications. So you have to be monitoring the CPU usage that your cloud apps are using and make sure enough CPUs are provisioned for those cloud applications. Storage access speed, also important. Um, 
it's just never possible for a cloud-based hard drive to be as fast for you as your locally local one in your computer. So if you had a SSD in your local computer plugged in to a SATA 3 bus, it's going to be really hard to even match that speed. Certainly, we, we're not going to be able to surpass that speed um, with a similar hard drive on the internet because we don't have the bandwidth. We just don't have the capacity to move the bits fast enough because we have latency and bandwidth issues that you don't have on your local computer. In fact, that, that's a big problem right now with cloud computers is the storage access speed. As the cloud gets used more, there's more and more data in it and more and more data has to be moved up and down between your end and the cloud provider. And the speeds are actually getting slower because we want to move more information and we've pretty much maxed out our internet. So what we need is faster internet connections. So there's always a need for more bandwidth and less latency. Data replication. We need to be able to replicate the data and data integration. We need to be able to integrate the data with various apps. And that gets into the standardization that we looked at earlier. And then network security. We have to be able to secure, usually through encryption, we want to make sure that our data is safely stored as well as safely transmitted. We don't want any prying eyes watching what we're doing over the connection and stealing our data or modifying it. So network security is an important part and uh, certainly a risk to cloud computing that you don't necessarily have on a personal computer. This is really looking at application performance on the cloud versus using it on a traditional um, locally installed Finally, application architecture. These are just the three different um, layers of application architecture, building blocks, target platform, and service-oriented architecture. Read on these in the chapter. These are the three important um, parts that are affected by cloud computing. So cloud computing affects definitely the application architecture. Well, that's it for chapter three. Thank you.